Okay, um, I've given you sort of a long discussion topic uh, introduction this week, so um, what I'm doing is recording a video to um, introduce the topic and talk about why I think it's an interesting discussion uh, in the context of um, the understanding of Western philosophy and human you know, capacities that we're building this semester um, it, through a treatment of introduction to Western philosophy. Um, I've printed out the topic, and it's a long one. I'll start off by reading it. An overview of the argument presented by Hobbes and his Leviathan can be presented fairly simply. Human beings are led by desire and at root self-interested creatures. Left to our own devices, uh, we would produce a state of war, our, our natural state, where we are naturally diffident towards one another. This line of all our argument culminates in the 13th chapter of Leviathan, where he asserts on page 185, hereby is manifest, that during a time men live without a common power to keep them in awe, they are in a condition in which is called war, and such a war as is of every man against every man. This line of argument that ultimately, this is the line of argument that ultimately justifies Hobbes' call to establish an ab absolute sovereign power in the person of a monarch um, through uh, the Commonwealth Covenant. As Orlando Tan in that School of Life video um, that I provided uh, stresses a feature of Hobbes' position um, that asserts that we would have, quote, a subsequent duty to keep obeying with only a few rights to complain. Right? So we have to subject ourselves to this common power. We have a duty to obey. Uh, Baton further notes of Hobbes' position that if citizens under such a social contract complain of the, quote, inconvenience of a ruler with an inclination to do wicked deeds, the fault was really that of the citizens themselves, since, quote, if men could rule themselves, there would be no need at all of a coercive power. So this really sets up the fundamental presupposition behind Hobbes' argument, right? If we were capable of ruling ourselves, then we wouldn't need sovereign power. So really, if we complain about the oppressiveness of a so sovereign power, we're really complaining about ourselves because we're incapable of self-rule and left to our own devices, we'd be at each other's throats. Now, um, this insight into Hobbes' argument uh, raises an interesting issue with regard to self-rule and something that provides sort of a rather big distinction between this position and that which we took a look at from Socrates. So what I've got here recalls Socrates' position in the context of Athenian democracy held that we were all capable of self-rule. The arguments in the Apology and the Crito stem from this assumption and lay out the groundwork for the sorts of activities and dispositions necessary for self-rule. Hobbes' position runs fundamentally counter to this proposition by arguing that the human faculty of reason, upon which Socrates based his political optimism, is merely a tool for calculating self-interest. So when we use reason, really what we're doing is deploying reason to further our own self-interested sort of aspirations, right? Really, if reason is a tool of desire. Engaging with these arguments from Hobbes and Socrates, your discussion topic is this. Would you argue that human beings are capable of self-rule? If so, on what basis? Now, this looks like I'm asking you to pick a side, right, between Socrates and Hobbes. Um, to a certain extent, yeah, that's the boundary of the argument, but nonetheless, recall that Socrates was very, very optimistic in his own situation, the, the, the trial and his subsequent execution, right, really illustrated the failings to live up to the ideals of justice that were present in Athenian society. Why, why, why was Socrates' argument necessary and top, topical in the context of Athenian democracy that we saw in the Apology and the Credo? Because the trials were a farce and the courts were meeting out injustices rather than justices. 
rather than justice, right? So, I mean, effectively what Hobbes does is pick up where Socrates left off. Recall in Socrates we found this notion of a social contract, right? In Hobbes, on the other hand, he's using this notion of a social contract as sort of a defense against ourselves rather than as Socrates would put it, right, a call to democratic duty. Right? So it really there's a fundamental tension between these two theorists. Now, uh, I think this is one of the more topical but timely kind of discussions that we can have. It, do we have a categorical duty to obey the social contract, right, it, to not overthrow a ruler, even when that ruler is, as Baton noted, um, somebody with an inclination to do evil deeds, right? Or do we actually have a duty to demand of the system that we find ourselves subject to that that system actually stands up, right? And it represents the best in us, right? Represents the most just laws, the most fair society kind of thing. So really, what is it about human beings that either prevents us from ruling ourselves or allows us to engage in these sorts of activities? Now, the last thing I'm going to point out to you um, in a series of books by contemporary theorists that I have right here um, in uh, Hart and Gray's Multitude, in their Empire, and in uh, their Commonwealth. These are three books that sort of mirror the structure of Hobbes' argument, um, and in fact fundamentally criticize Hobbes' argument on the basis of sort of a democratic sensibility. Right. They argue that contemporary protest movements right, have actually demonstrated a capacity for self-rule and self-organization. Right. The kind of organization that it goes from the ground up rather th than from a power structure, uh, you know, sort of embodied by an authority figure, uh, down to ruling us. So we can, from sort of a grassroots sort of a cooperative kind of environment rule ourselves, right? One of the big examples, but it's only one, is the, um, the Occupy movement, which had no clear authority figure or leader, but nonetheless an organizational structure effectively established itself, right? Is this possible? Right? Because really, the Hart and Gray's argument is this is what democracy looks like. So it mirrors Socrates' argument because what does democracy look like for Socrates? Citizens having rational sort of conversations with one another that actually lead to not only dispositions but actions of the moral sort, right? So we can do it ourselves, argues Socrates. Hobbes says, no, we're not capable of it because our passions always went out and reason is just a tool of those passions. Suppose my question is, do you buy it? Right? Are we capable of self-rule or no? Right. So I look forward to reading this one. Um, it should be uh, an interesting discussion. All right.